operating room at Duke Spine Institute, getting ready to perform a Duke laser disc repair. Our patient is here. Uh, hi, it's Dr. Duke. We're going to get started, okay? I know you waited all day. So I'm going to start by giving you some numbing medicine. You'll feel a little stick and burn, okay? Just don't move. Try to lay real still. If you feel pain, just say, ouch, into my back. Just say, ouch, back or ouch, leg. The two places you might feel it are your back or your leg. I don't think you're going to feel any in your leg. But if you do, say, ouch, leg, okay? All right, so I'm going to give you a little numbing medicine. You'll feel a little poke. So that's my hand touching you, okay? Now, our patient has a history of herniated disc at L4, L5. Yep, just relax. You're fine. If it gets really bad, let me know, okay? I'm just giving you some numbing medicine right now. It'll feel better in just a moment. I apologize. So he has a history of herniated disc at L4-5. He's had surgery elsewhere. Where were your surgeries? Baton Rouge. Baton Rouge. All right, and they did a microdiscectomy. How's our blood pressure? Okay, good. Okay, so another little poke right here. I know. All right, so he had surgery in Baton Rouge and they did a microdiscectomy. He continued to have problems with pain in the back afterwards. And um, he ended up having problems in the thoracic as well. He's had surgery there and he's just still in pain in both areas. So I looked at the MRI. He has a herniated disc at 045 on both sides, pinching the nerve. So we're gonna go in there and actually unpinch the nerve permanently this time. And unlike a microdiscectomy, we're not going to take the bones and ligaments out from the back of the spine. We're not touching them. We're not going to weaken the spine like a microdiscectomy does. Are you comfortable? All right, remember, if you feel pain, you just say, ouch, okay? And I will give you some more numbing medicine. Now, I'm going to keep you awake for a little while in the beginning, and then I'm going to put you to sleep, okay? Any questions for me before we get started? No, huh? no you're good. Well, I'm talking to my patient. Oops. So, yep, I heard that shot. Now, I'm going to be talking to my team as we go along, okay? You're going to hear me say shot. What that means is I'm taking a picture. It's like a shot with a camera. It's an old-fashioned te terminology, but it basically means, let's see where we are. So in the beginning of the surgery, I have to get down to your uh, painful disc safely, and that's what we're doing right now. We've already started. Are you comfy? Perfect. All right, so we can see L4-5. Let's try to line the pedicle of four up just a little better. I feel like we're off there. Sean. 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 Are you comfy? Don't worry, everything is going quite well. Sean? I can feel the facet. Sean? All right, let's go AP. You've been through a lot. Mm -hmm. All right. So I need to go a little more lateral. Lateral. So because our patient has leg pain on both sides, that means the nerve is being pinched or irritated on both sides of the disc, which really means I have to go on both sides of the disc, okay, to, get, to fix the problem. I have to actually go on both sides. That's the only way to do it, Sean. 
So um, that's what I'm doing. I'm actually going on both sides. Shot. No worries. You're okay. Promise. Nothing's wrong. Everything's going well. So this is the hardest part for you. And believe it or not, it's the hardest part for me. So once we get done with this, you'll be you'll be able to go to sleep. And the rest of the surgery is much easier, okay, Sean? What is it? Shot. Believe it or not, you got a quite a bit of arthritis in the back of your spine. Shot. AP. We're going to get there. Don't worry. Yep, all right. So let's go back to a lateral. And I think he's got a little bit of scoliosis. So let's see if we can accommodate that with some orbit. Let's just go back to our lateral. You may have to drop, yeah, you may have to drop your side a little bit. Shot. Yeah, that actually looks a little better. I don't think we're perfect yet, but that's good. That's a good start. We're getting there. Yeah, I know. Shot. Shot. He's very anterior. You okay? Shot. Shot. Is that uncomfortable? Yes. We're gonna we're gonna give you a little more numbing medicine. Huh. Shot. So we're just going to take our time so we can get down there and get it done right. Shot. Okay. Just lay still. You're doing great. Shot. When you come back and watch this later, you'll see what we had to go through to get this thing done right. You're okay. I promise. It may be a bit uncomfortable, but everything's going fine. Shot. You agree, four five? We're almost there. Shot AP. Now you can see the sacrum down below, the tailbone. You can see the L5 bone, the L4 on the x ray. He is a bit rotated there at four five, but that looks really good. Really good. I can actually feel the herniation. Lateral. Mm-hmm. Shot. Yep. I'm excited for you, my friend. Mm. Now, let's get that local again. I want to make sure it's nice and numbed up. So you get to hear what the surgeon's saying. It's pretty cool, huh? And then you're going to get to watch your surgery. I'm just giving you some more of that numbing medicine. I know it's a bit uncomfortable up here at the skin level, but it's going to feel better because of that. I've given a total of nine cc's. So we're going on both sides, as I said before, and the reason for that is he has herniations on both sides. And he has leg pain on both sides. And if he, huh? 
Oh, no, we're okay. Yeah, there's going to be some, but I've done this on people who had fusions before, like lumbar fusions. I don't know what that's there for. And we, we, we get it just fine. You'll be fine. You'll be fine. I'm not worried about that. I'll give you a little more numbing medicine. I apologize. Shot. Uh-huh. How's our blood pressure? Uh, let's see if we can get it improved. I don't know. What about an actual antihypertensive shot? So as you do this, you have to really look past the first needle and just go to the second with your mind. Otherwise, you get caught up. Two hundred people watching. Shot. Dang. All right, AP. So we've accessed L four five on the left. Now we're going to the right side. So that way they know what's going on. Uh huh. Where's my uh, lateral view? Do you have it? All right, I think we need to be a little more medial. All right. Let's go back to a lateral. So your spine is a little bit twisted and we call that scoliosis. Nothing to be concerned about. So don't, don't worry, you don't need scoliosis surgery. Someday, it may get worse. I don't think it will, but it could. And even then, you still don't need scoliosis surgery unless the scoliosis itself is causing you problems, okay? Shot. We're right near the facet joints. What's that? You feel it on the right? All right, you're doing great. Let's get an AP. See those facet, superior facet of five is kind of offset like bunny ears. I wonder if we can't fix that with orbit, okay? Let's try to correct it with orbit because that's right where we are. All right, let's go back. It's got a very unusual pedicle. Looks like um, the doctor probably took away a lot of that bone during his surgery. If you look at that L5 pedicle on the right. All right. You're doing great. Like I said, we're almost done. Shot. Mm-hmm. Shot. Where do you feel it? Anywhere? In the back, good. Not down the leg. AP? So we're passing the facet joint right now and we're entering the neuroforamen just underneath the exiting root of L4. Yeah. So let me look at that lateral again. And blood pressure, are we getting it down? Uh, where's my lateral? Oh, but I need a new lateral. All right, I got about two centimeters to go. Where's the AP? You ditched it? All right. Shot. All right, so we're there. Let's get an AP. 
So we use a combination of anterior, posterior, and lateral, which is front, back, and side to side, two different views of x-ray to navigate to the disc that we're trying to fix. All right, let's get those spinous processes more midline. So I think you need to correct a little bit toward, no, other way. I think you need a little more. Okay. That's better. I like it. So we're right at the lateral margin of the disc. All right, let's go back to a lateral view, please. And you can see the surgery begins with getting into the tear in the back of the disc with a skinny, tiny little needle. And then we switch it over to, um, we switch it over to the, to the guide wire shot. It's looking good. Any pain in your back? All right. Great. All right. Very, very good. So at this point, we're going to confirm. Now you get back pain whenever you're active, right? So, how bad is that on a scale of 1 to 10? Did I find your spot? We just tested the L4-5 disc. Is that your typical pain you get? Good news is when you wake up, that will be gone for the rest of your life. Yeah, 10 out of 10, typical. All right, I'm going to put you to sleep, okay? When you wake up, we'll be done with your surgery. All right, you did good. You did real good. Go ahead and count from 1 to 100 for me out loud starting at 1. And count in Creole. <laughs> I got to laugh out of him. <laughs> Keep going. You're doing good. All right, so for those of you watching, you can see on the x-ray the dark color that we injected into the disc at L45 actually filled the disc and then leaked out in the back and the front. And what that material is, is it's a dye. You're doing great, just lay still, don't move. And it's a contrast dye called Omnipake, very uh, safe. And what it does though, is it allows the x-ray machine to pick up on where the tear is. And you can see there's a big tear in the back of that disc. Now, how do we show them the tear using the arrow or what is it? How do you do that? So we're going to put the arrow right there. Jordan nailed it. Uh, up, yeah, right there. So the arrow is, is on the tear. You can see that tear. So we're going to go ahead and get in there and fix that tear. That tear is causing the back pain that he gets. And if you look, he's, his spine is deep inside, okay? And the old scar from his old surgery is right there. I'm marking it out for you right there. From there to there, that's the old scar. It's right here, this line right there. And that's where he had his prior back surgery. Now we're gonna fix this disc with two little cuts on the side here, because we're coming in it from the side. Now, right there is a bone called the L4 bone, it's number four. And then just below it, you got another bone called number five. Number five, okay? So that's L5, L4. L stands for lumbar. That's part of the spine we're in. And then between them is, is this disc, this little soft cushion. And he's got a tear on each side of the cushion. And when I put the needles in and tested that tear, it was a 10 over 10 pain. And then we call it concordant because that's his typical pain. So that disc is a very painful disc for him. He's just been babying it by being careful not to move or twist or be active. All right, but anytime he gets active, he gets that pain there and it sets it off and it hurts real bad, real sharp. So we're gonna get in there and fix that today. All right, we're gonna fix the tear, fix the herniation and he's gotta let it heal properly without doing too much. He's gotta not lift anything too heavy. Gotta take it easy, okay? Let's get a shot. 
All right, so I got the guide wire down the, the needle. By the way, unfortunately, they don't have this surgery in Texas. Nothing against Texas. Louisiana. Sorry, Louisiana, I apologize. Trust me, we had a Texas patient earlier and I got a little confused with them. So, but Louisiana, um, they don't have it there either. And the reason is because it's a newer technology that is just coming out and it's going to take the place of spinal fusions and artificial discs. Problem is not many doctors know how to do it. I got a knife down. So we just made a seven millimeter incision. And now I'm going to bring this dilator down along the guide wire. Okay. Yeah, he's a a very strong man he's got a lot of muscle back here so but we're passing through it and unlike the first surgery where they actually cut the muscle off the bone and did some muscle damage we're not going to do muscle damage we're just going and spreading the muscle with the tip of the dilator so this 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 metal pencil you're looking at is so skinny it doesn't cut the muscle it actually just pushes it apart all right now that we pushed it apart we're actually going to hold it apart with a tube and we're going to take that dilator out and we're just going to leave the, the skinny little tube in there to hold everything open so I can do the surgery. Flat. All right. You're fine. He's okay. Take. Now we got the guide wire out. We got the dilator starting to go in. Is that my shot? Yep, I'm gonna finish it up. Now, shot. Now the good news is this metal thing called the dilator is not doing any damage anywhere in the body except for the skin. That's the only place I cut and did damage. And the skin is just a seven millimeter incision. But see, when I went into the disc, I went in through the tear that's already there. So the damage was already done. That's what we're there to fix. This is the we call it the milkshake straw and that's what we're going to do the whole surgery through this skinny little straw seven millimeters across this is true endoscopic minimally invasive spine surgery i'm going to run this down on top of the dilator and then when i get it where i want it we're going to take the dilator out and we're going to do the surgery and i'm going to show you what i see inside the body shot okay thank you louise Luis is amazing, the best assistant I ever had, even better than Augusto. Sorry, Augusto. Augusto, may he rest in peace. All right, there it is, the tube's in. Honestly, I think this is probably the best team I've ever had. 16 years of doing this. So look at this. Can you guys see this here, Diego? Yes. So I brought this through the skin. You all see that through the skin? Mm -hmm. Down, down to that tear right there. You see the tear? You can zoom in a little bit so you can see it, right? Okay. See the little tear? I drew it on the skin. Yes. And I pushed this through the tear and then kind of hammered it in. So now it's like that. But I went through the tear in the disc. We're going to do the same thing on the other side. We're not actually hurting the disc. We're going through the part that's already damaged. So then I'm going to clean that up. It's going to take away his back pain and his leg pain. I'm confident. I'm confident because I've done it over 1,300 times. Now, the only thing I worry about with him is that he's going to feel so good afterwards that he's going to go out and do something like he shouldn't, like pick something up, try to carry something heavy. He's got to keep that lifting under um, 25 pounds for the first six weeks. So he's got to really take it easy. And then baby is back for the first year. Okay, what I mean by that is just take it easy for the first year.
So 40 pounds maximum for the first year. All right, we're going down the rabbit hole. You guys are going to be able to see what we see. I'm going to bring in the irrigation. And we're going to be inside the disc when we turn the scope on. Is the scope on, guys? So, yeah. So we're inside the disc. Are you guys able to see or not? Not yet? No, not yet. All right. Well, I'm going to keep going. I'm pulling out a piece of herniation. You guys will see. So what I got there is the, is the grabbers. We call it pituitary or grabbers it's for slang. And we're inside that herniation right now. We're inside that bad disc that's causing all that pain. Yeah, we see it now. And I'm going to clean all this up, and that's going to take the pain away in his back and his legs. Thank you. I've been doing spine surgery now 26 years as a neurosurgeon. And obviously with some of the best training in the world. And I tell you, this surgery, I was not taught during my training. I had to go to overseas and learn from the Koreans how to do this. And then I came back and I did some more work with Dr. Young, Tony Young, and he's amazing. But he's retired. I'm just glad I had the opportunity to work with him before he retired. And Dr. Young has done far more endoscopic surgeries than I have, but he's also a lot older than me. So someday when I get to be his age, hopefully I'll have around as many as he did. He was a true pioneer endoscopic spine surgery in the United States. So. But he didn't do cervical, which is the neck, and he didn't do thoracic. I'm the pioneer for thoracic and cervical in the United States. Now the Koreans were doing cervical endoscopic surgery before me. I learned from them. But then nobody has done trans thoracic transferaminal. I actually pioneered that technique. Started doing it in 2020. We did our first eight cases. They all went really well. And now we're, uh, we're, we're doing them more regularly because people are finding out about it that we do it, that type of surgery for a painful thoracic disc herniation. Thoracic herniations are not common. They're very rare. But some people get them. Some people get them and they calcify. They get hard, hard as a rock. All right, so the laser is obviously the blue line at the top and it's got a blue plastic covering and then it's got that crystal clear end and that end is glass. It's made out of glass. And the way the laser works, quite interesting, it actually bounces the laser beam which is created the laser beam energy is created in a machine over by the feet can't see it but it's as big as two suitcases and uh, that little guy cost you as much as a Ferrari just for that laser that's how expensive it is it's not as fast as a Ferrari but <laughs> costs as much as one Anyway, the laser is wonderful. It allows us to do these surgeries whenever we want to. For many years, I had to rent it and just pay for it on an as-needed basis. But we got tired of trying to coordinate the laser company schedule and with ours, and we decided just to make the investment and buy it. So we got our own laser. We love it. Right, Luis? It's wonderful to have that available to do surgery whenever we need to. But it's how much do you think that thing weighs? 200 pounds more it's really heavy so it may weigh as much as a Ferrari and cost as much but it's a big old machine and it produces a tiny little beam of energy that travels along this glass tube right to the disc right to where the surgeon puts that thing look at that tear is beautiful look at it right over there you see it that is the torn annulus the little yellow stuff and then torn on the other side and that blue stuff is the herniation stuck in there. 
now scarred in. All these years of chronic inflammation just scarred it right in there. Like cemented it in. And now I'm going in there to clean it all up. This is called the annular debridement. This surgery you're watching that I do is the only surgery in the world that does this. It's because we're the ones who discovered it right here. Discovered it at Duke Spine Institute 16 years ago when I started doing these and I figured out the reason why people's pain went away after the surgery in their back was because of the annular debridement that I did with the laser. Rarely do surgeons use a laser and when they do, they don't usually do an annular debridement. They just stick it in there for a few seconds and they're done. But you can see with the laser surgery, the Duke laser disc repair, we actually use it for the whole surgery because it's necessary. Can't do the surgery without it. All right. So we're going to finish both sides and then I'm going to do a thoracic uh, facet block on this patient because he's also having some problems with his thoracic spine where he had a fusion done. I didn't do that fusion, but someone else did and we're going to find out whether or not The, uh, the joints above the fusion are the cause of his pain that he still has. All right. Any questions from our audience? Patient's doing really good. Stable? No, uh, not yet. Looking good. Huh? Not yet. No questions yet? Nope. Don't worry, if you're watching and you want to ask me a question, ask me a question. <clears throat> I can do more than one thing at a time. In those 1,300 patients plus I've done, I've done about two discs per patient. So really I've done over 2,500 discs, disc repairs, in about 1,300 patients. That's a lot of disc repairs. That's like after you brush your teeth 1,000, or sorry, 2,500 times, you get pretty good at it. You stop having to really think about it. It just comes kind of natural. Right, Luis? All right. That's the tear on the backside called the lateral part of the tear. Can't forget about that. Some surgeons don't know about that. They just ignore it and they don't realize that that needs to be repaired as well. How much laser energy have we dumped into this disc? Eight. Eight joules. Stand by. We've gotten some discs where we put in 40. 40 joules of energy. Huh? 64 is our highest? My gosh. Wow. Anybody watch the Formula One race uh, in England a couple of weeks ago? When Lewis Hamilton took out Max Verstappen of note, it was a really bad crash. Max Verstappen hit the barricade with 51 G's of force. Speaking of numbers, 51 times gravitational force. It's massive. And he walked away. Well, Arias had an accident at Road America in an F4 car and he hit the barricade at 52 G's, one G more. Basically the same impact Verstappen had, and Arias walked away as well. That's a massive impact though, in a race car. Well, there's a new trauma hospital. Where is it? 
Oh, yeah. What's the name of the town? Is it towards the lake? Oh, Appleton. Wait a second. I went to Appleton. No way. There's a racetrack there, like a small private one. It's called Black Horse or Black Farms. Yeah. Oh, we were there. Yeah. Black Farm, Black something, I can't remember. It was in Appleton. Yeah, beautiful area, my gosh. Are the paper mills still going? Oh, good. Nothing like supporting one of our esteemed nurses, hometown businesses. All right, this is a big tear. Look at all that scar tissue and trying to heal, but still causing pain. It's like having a fracture on your foot and then you keep walking on it every day and stepping on it just never heals until you get your weight off it. So the problem is when you tear your disc and you get an annular tear with a herniation, it just can't heal as long as you keep moving around, putting pressure on it. You're just gonna aggravate it and it'll never heal properly. So people's quality of life goes down because they're always sitting around trying to ease up their back pain, not doing anything. And, it's, and they think it's gonna fix it, but it doesn't. It just feels better for a little while until you're back on your feet, and then you're, re you're aggravating that herniation again. What's wrong? Oh, I'm sorry, Luis, I'll stop talking. You getting emotional? Any questions from the audience? Yes, we have one question. Is the baby being removed? Okay, you have to have a little more volume and you got to speak, enunciate. Can you hear me better now? Uh, still pretty bad. I can barely hear anything. I just hear mumbling. How about now? A little more volume. Is this better? Too much. You went way too high. Okay. Can you hear me now? That's pretty good. You may be a tad bit higher. Okay. That's good. All right. Someone asked, is the baby being removed? All right. Just, I know I'm not trying to be a jerk to you, I promise, but can you slow down your speech and enunciate? Because it's hard to hear with the uh, speaker system. Okay. Someone asked, is the baby being removed? Did you guys understand what he asked? Is the brain being removed? Is debris. Oh, debris. Yes. Yes, the debris. You see all those little things floating in the water right there? It looks like, I don't know, cloudy stuff. That is the debris. It's floating up the tube and out. Good question. Yep, the debris is being removed through the irrigation. It's, uh, it's like us cutting with a saw, cutting a tile or a piece of wood, mostly a, a wet saw, like for cutting tile. So the, the saw has water blasting on its cutting surface as it cuts, so it removes and lubricates and gets rid of all that debris. So this is, yeah, all this stuff here is why he's having so much pain. This is all part of the herniation. And all that debris is being removed by the water, by the irrigation. It's coming out the tube. It's like a fountain. It just flows out. Any more questions? That was a good question. That's all. All right. We're just about done on this left side. And he's been doing fantastic. He's very stable. 
and I'm almost done here. I just want to make sure we get everything. This will heal up real nice, but I got to get all this junk out of here that's keeping it from healing. This is, you know, a lot of years of uh, scar tissue and inflammation that's just jammed up in here and it's keeping it from healing itself. So his body's been trying to heal this for years. You can tell by the amount of scar tissue it's been going on for a long time, like years. So now that I'm cleaning it out, he's gonna heal this up beautifully as long as he doesn't re-injure it. So. And lateral. We have another question. Sure. When did you, did you realize there was a better way to do back surgery? When did I realize there was a better way to do back surgery? It was uh, the year that I saw this, this technique, you know. <laughs> Um, so there was no such thing as endoscopic spine surgery being taught in my training and I went to a top training program. It wasn't taught anywhere in any training program. It was really just um, known to a few surgeons that were pioneers and I mean a really limited number of people like probably worldwide maybe 10 and they caught each other and I just happened to fall into that circle and got taught I got lucky I got a guy who wanted to sell me the tubes and the cameras and the scopes a rep a rep and he saw an opportunity to make money so he invited me to meet some surgeons that were doing this surgery that he was servicing so he could sell more of the products and of course, when I first heard about it from him, <clears throat> he introduced it to me. I was a big spinal fusion guy. I was doing all kinds of fusions. I would do sometimes 10 a week. This was back in 2004, 2005. I mean, and when he mentioned endoscopic laser surgery, I nearly laughed my kidney out of my side. Uh, I was a bit closed-minded, to be honest with you shamed of myself now but God's honest truth was I didn't really believe in it then I went and saw one done and the patient survived survived the surgery which to me was remarkable sticking a metal tube in someone's flank and how could they survive I've never seen anything like that so they survived and went home and I was like wow so then I really got interested in it and wanted to know more so I trained and, and learned how to do it. Went overseas, did more training with the Koreans and Germans and came back, did more training. And then I started doing it myself. And of course it was very scary at first, but you know, pioneering new technology, you have to be brave and you have to be smart about it and do it. Can't live in fear of what might happen. You have to plan and do your best. To me, it seems safe. I've seen it done and people were starting to do it around the world and I said, you know, I'm gonna do this. So I did it, of course, with patient consent and awareness and we're gonna do the other side. So we, we're not ready yet, so. Anyway, that said, huh? Um, no, sorry, yeah. So hold on, let's pipe it out. Yep, nice. Um, so basically, <laughs> I, uh, I, saw the, I saw my own results were amazing. Like the patient's pain went away, their back pain went away, their neck pain went away with this procedure, along with the arm symptoms and the leg symptoms. So I was fixing their radicular symptoms which is what other surgeons aim for fixing with laminectomies, microdiscectomies and whatnot. I was fixing those symptoms, but I was also curing the back pain and the neck pain. So I was not just fixing the radicular symptoms, I was always fixing, also fixing the axial pain, which, oh yeah, I see what you mean. 
which was uh, very special to be able to do that. And then I started to wonder why was I able to do that, asking questions, trying to figure it out. And that's when I realized that it was not the pinching of nerves, but it was actually the tear that was the source of the back pain and neck pain. So I figured it out. Meanwhile, I was doing more of these procedures and patients were loving it and doing great. So, and here I am. Of course, I started publishing papers and I started presenting the surgery at meetings. I travel all over the world, Hong Kong, uh, Miami, California, Los Angeles, um, Chicago. I went and gave lectures. I was invited to speak and present this technology and surgeons were seem, seemed to be very interested, but then I came across um, the power of, of big corporations that manufacture the implants and they were not happy about me taking their business away. Basically with this surgery, you don't need rods and screws and cages. You don't need plates and metal and plastic. None of that's necessary, it's all natural. Of course, I was eating into their margins, and that's when they basically uh, leveraged their relationships with surgeons that, uh, it's a lateral, dude, we never use an AP, go lateral, it's always a lateral, every time I tell you guys, lateral. Um, yeah, I'll switch with you. You want to close the site up, or just wait? So basically, um, the, the companies that saw my talks and realized what we were doing and how successful it was, they basically told their main spine surgeons that are at educational institutions, don't do this, stick with the implants. And of course, they offered them, um, you know, speaking engagements and uh, consulting agreements worth millions of dollars on the side. So organized neurosurgery and organized orthopedic surgery basically are in collusion with the implant manufacturers like Medtronic, Depew, Johnson & Johnson, Nuvasiv, Alphatech, etc. to keep this technology from reaching the world and patients being aware of it because it doesn't, they don't sell $10,000, $20,000 worth of screws and rods and cages with it. They don't get any money. So it's safer and better for patients. And it's a shame that my colleagues don't prioritize what's best for the patients because they know about the surgery and yet they act like it doesn't exist so they can keep making the money from putting implants in. So I decided at that point, screw them. I'm gonna go to the public and let them know what's happening. And that's why we, we started broadcasting eight, nine years ago. And we've been broadcasting ever since. So here we are. That's the story. You know, it's a shame that um, doctors don't do what's best for their patients. It's really a shame. You know, there are things I don't know how to do the best as a neurosurgeon, okay? I'm not the best neurosurgeon to take out an acoustic neuroma tumor in the brain. There are people far better than me that have done it more times, they're more skilled, they can do it safer and more effective. How's he doing? So when I have a patient with an acoustic neuroma, guess what I do? I don't try to take it out, all right? Sure, I can make lots of money taking a brain tumor out, but the reality is, is that's not what's best for the patient. So doctors need to start doing what's best for their patients and not what's best for themselves. And if they did that, then this technology you're watching would be everywhere because they're gonna p get paid less for it. I get less money for this than I do a fusion. Um, and they're gonna have to go and learn if they wanna do this stuff. So. In the end, I've given up on doctors and medicine, assimilating new technology like this. I've learned that medicine is very different. It's controlled by big companies with lots of money and they wanna, they wanna basically steal all the healthcare dollars to fund their, their, um, their greed. 
okay? I'll give you an example. Spine robots, what an absolute waste. An absolute waste of money to spend a million dollars on a robot. Uh, I've never used a robot and I have had the best results in spine surgery in the world with my fusions. You don't need a robot, okay? All the robot does is make a company rich the ones that sell the robots and all the disposable parts for every surgery. So is it better for the patient? Absolutely not. Does it help? No, it doesn't. But it's marketed well, and the sales team that sell the robots will tell everybody how necessary they are and how they're the future, but they don't actually do any good for the patient. So the other big scam is these electronic shot medical records, okay? Because EMRs, like the VA, is literally the vet VA hospital that doesn't have enough money to pay for veterans to get surgery they need, is spending $16 billion for an EMR, which is basically a patient database. I mean, it's a total scam. Why is that happening? Because the senators that voted for the VA budget for $16 billion, and by the way, they're already over $20 billion in overage. You know, they're way over. Like, they're going to hit $10 billion in overage. That's why it's under criticism right now. So the VA is spending $20 billion on an electronic medical record system that is not going to improve patient care at all. I'm sorry. People will argue with me. They'll want to they'll come after me with a lynch mob. But that's the God's honest truth. Look at the medical care we do here. We really don't even use an EMR. We scan our documents in. I don't actually use the EMR database. So are my patients doing worse? Heck no, they're doing better than any hospital with an EMR. Because it has nothing to do with the EMR. It has to do with good medical care. And the problem is the VA is like bankrupt, and yet somehow these scoundrels found $20 billion of taxpayer money to pay for a, a computer program and hardware this is a herniation, by the way. So yeah, it really pisses me off because I'm the one taking care of the vets and the VA just denies paying for their treatment. You know, they have a doctor who sits there and says, no, no, stamps, no, no, denied, denied, denied. And I know who he is, his name is Dr. Jacob. Patrick Jacob, he's a neurosurgeon. Wow, look at the herniation here. Let's get on here and let's show everybody this herniation. It's amazing. Put it right here. Yep. Can you see? Yes. <laughs> Look at the herniations we just pulled out. Those things are huge. All right, again, the grabber did it. Okay, there's two of them. We grabbed them both out. Pretty cool, huh? So I personally think that the EMRs are a total scam, totally unnecessary, and uh, they're just robbing dollars away from actually taking care of people and their medical problems. Here's another herniation. Look at that one. This is herniation extravaganza. Pretty cool. All right. So yeah, it makes me upset that all the lies that are happening to the public. Why don't you look at the news, you'll see how many hospitals are closing down, going at bankrupt. Why they don't have any money. Why? Because the insurance companies are basically keeping it. They're denying paying for MRIs and x-rays and surgeries. Uh, number of procedures has gone down to fix people, yet the cost of health care keeps going up and the insurance companies keep pocketing it. We have a lot of problems in health care in the United States and worldwide. They're not going to be fixed until people start understanding the truth about the issues in health care that are going on and what's driving it. There's an old saying, follow the money. If you follow the money, you'll find out Who's behind it? <coughs> All right. We have another question. Yeah. Are there any up and coming spine surgeons that want to learn your techniques? Are there any up and coming spine surgeons that want to learn your techniques? Mm -hmm. So the answer is yes, of course. There are going to be people like me that want to do the best and be the best for their patients but there are not a lot of them and the truth is most of them don't even know about this procedure 
uh, I guarantee you, if you took 100 spine surgeons, put them in a room, and showed them this surgery, they would think that we're not, they would say you're not doing spine surgery. I have no idea what they're doing, but that's some kind of an ob procedure or a, a urology procedure on the kidney, but that is not spine surgery because they've never seen anything like this or even heard about it. Now, that said, I'm reading more and more kind of in the news that more surgeons, like names I've never heard before that are new, they're like, oh yeah, I started doing endoscopic spine surgery and I've been doing it for uh, three years now, a long time, three years, and it's amazing, you know? So I'm seeing new names write articles, publish articles about endoscopic spine surgery, names that I've never seen before, names that are newer names. So I think there's definitely some interest by surgeons that are smart and understand the benefit of this procedure to the patients. And I think that you're gonna see more of it over time. Um, it's definitely on the rise. And it's just that there's, you know, there are 6,000 spine surgeons right now in the United States, 6,000. 3,000 orthopedics and 3,000 neurosurgeons that are spine surgeons. And of those 6,000, there are probably 60 at most that are doing endos true endoscopic surgery like this in the lumbar spine, not even the neck, just the lumbar, which is the easiest part to do. So 60, 600, 6,000, you're talking about 1%. Probably 1% of spine surgeons are capable of doing, you know, maybe not well, but just at least having a basic understanding of this type of surgery. The reason is this surgery, you can't use metal. You can't do a fusion, okay? So if you want to do fusion on a patient, you don't do this kind of surgery. You do a fusion. And so um, the, most of the surgeons are being taught to do fusions and artificial discs. So this is the opposite direction. This is like ordering seafood instead of a steak. You know, <laughs> right? This is like red wine instead of white wine. So most people are going for the red wine this is a white wine option. This is like, you don't do this surgery unless you really know what you're doing and you've had extra advanced training, way beyond fusions, okay? And not many people have access to that. This is not read a book and do it. This is not like a YouTube home video. This is like a year of training, a year of training that doesn't even exist in the United States in a training program. If you go to the University of Chicago, if you go to the University of Miami, if you go to Shands Hospital, they don't do this surgery there. So how are the next generation of surgeons gonna learn if they're not teaching it at the university hospitals where all the surgeons are being trained to do their surgeries? That's because the, the spine surgeons at the university hospital, I hate to say it, are on the take from the implant companies. They're getting money, kickbacks, to put screws and rods. So they're being paid not to do this stuff, basically. Again, works for them, does not good for the patient. So I don't know what to tell you. I can't fix all that. People are gonna have to fix it, people other than me. I, got, I was always upset a long time ago, like why do I have to be the one to learn this stuff on my own and, you know, advocate for it and do it. It's hard, it's more work. I just want it to be easy, you know? But the reality is, is that nobody else was doing it. Dr. Young was the only one. And he's a true pioneer. So if I wasn't gonna do it, it wasn't gonna get done, basically. And not in my career not in my lifetime. So I had to do it myself. And I'm doing lots of things, by the way, I haven't talked about. Um, like with reimbursement, for example, we're taking on the insurance companies to pay for this surgery. And we're winning small, small victories, but eventually they'll add up and we're gonna win some big ones and then they'll change their coverage determinations up front.
So there's a lot going on. It's, it's more complicated than just learning how to do a surgery. There's reimbursement challenges. There's authorization challenges. There's payment challenges. And of course, without money, you can't do anything. So it's a complicated um, process that I've been working at for years trying to, to make it work. And we're finally starting to gain some traction and make it work. And it's all driven by results, by the way. I wouldn't be advocating for the surgery if it didn't work. I would just advocate for fusions like I used to before I knew how to do these surgeries. Fusions work really well if you know what you're doing and you do them right. And I have really good outcomes with fusions. As a matter of fact, I've published a paper on fusions, lumbar fusions as well. So if you look it up on PubMed, you can find one of my papers I published on transforaminal lumbar interbody fusion, okay? And I published that we had 85% elimination of preoperative back pain with the fusion surgeries. So I was able to get rid of 85% of people's back pain with fusion. That's higher than any other published result. And that's with multi-level fusions. That means doing more than one disc. So I had amazing fusion results. I still do. I know how to do it right. But that said, why do a fusion on a patient when you don't need to? This is a much better surgery. This fusion surgery would take two hours minimum and this patient would be in pain for weeks afterwards. Okay, no matter how good you are. And I would have them home in an hour and a half after surgery, maybe two hours. But even with that great result, he'd still be in pain for weeks. Taking narcotics, dilated, hydromorphone, just trying to get out of pain from the surgery itself. Not from the back problem, but from the surgery. From his muscles aching. So this is a much better surgery. You'll see tomorrow, this patient will come to the office and he... He'll be feeling really good, I think. All right, just about done here. Now we do have one more thing we're doing here. Do we have the uh, MBB? So Jordan, we're gonna go find the fusion and then we're gonna go above it, okay? And we're going to repair, or we're gonna do an MBB up above. Just about done, but we need the patient to stay awake, obviously, as we do as MBB. We got all those herniations out. Some great questions from friends and family, I suppose. I met his son and his wife, and they're wonderful people, very respectful, good family, well brought up. Maybe someday his son will become a doctor and make a change in other people's lives. I hope. All right, we're pretty much done here. Let me just zap this real quick. And then I'm gonna move to the thoracic. What do you got, 25s? Standby laser? All right. Oh, um, I don't care. Sleep is better if you can. Huh? Yeah, I think asleep is better because I just need them awake for the uh, DLDR because of the foramen and the root just to make sure I'm not, you know, there's a bone spur, just to make sure I'm not uh, touching the root, even though I'm nowhere near it, but you can see I'm nowhere near it, but just to be safe. So thoracic, I'm not gonna be anywhere near anything vital. <sighs> All right, so we're gonna wrap this uh, up now and focus on getting this patient's MBB done in the thoracic spine. Now if he responds well to the MBB, we'll be bringing him back and doing his thoracic RFA.
scope off. Made it on. Oh, this brown stuff, by the way, is betadine. I need the clear irrigation. The clear, oh, sorry, I thought it was the medicine. Okay. I'll put it down. Uh, do I need to suck it out though? Thank you. No, oh, I appreciate that. All right, folks, we are done with the bilateral DLDR. So we're going to take this tube out. And again, this is the milk milkshake tube. And then I'm going to get going on his thoracic MBB. So how do you want to break this down? I'll hold pressure while you break down. Take whatever you want to do with the scope. If you want to just leave it there, that's fine. What do you want to do? Just leave it? All right. So um, I'm going to place the needles and under fluoroscopic guidance, and then we'll inject. I will go to your side just to give me a little more room. Hold some pressure for me when you get a chance. Right there. So we've done our bilateral, both sides, DLDR, Duke Laser Disc Repair, repairing the tear and the herniation, removing the herniation at L45. That was to treat his lower back pain and the pain shooting down his legs when he's up walking and standing and doing things. We call that neurogenic claudication. Okay, now we're going to treat a different part of the spine where he's also had problems called the thoracic spine. And he's had um, a fusion up there. And basically, I'm going to go and numb up the joints above the fusion and see if that takes his pain away. It's a test. So the next thing isn't really a treatment, it's more of a test. Don't bend anything. They're directional, right? Well, they're but they're beveled at the end. Yeah, that's what I mean. All right. All right, so the first thing we're going to do is head north until we find the fusion mass. Go ahead, Jordan, whenever you're ready. All right, good. So, um... Let's get another picture. All right, and again, it's not too bad. All right, let's try to shoot down the disc. It's not terrible, Jordan, but let's see if we can get a better down the disc shot. And if you can zoom in, which means bring the uh, emitter other way, bring the emitter up closer to the bottom of the patient, that's fine. Let's see what we got. Not bad. Not too bad. I see the transverse process. I see the pedicle. I see the superior facet. Yeah, that's better. The transverse process is midline. It's in the middle. I think that looks pretty good, actually. Looks pretty good. All right. Well, let's give it... Uh, a try. Let me have a coker. You have one? Yes, or a needle holder is fine, or a coker. Okay. <laughs> I'm not used to playing with such skinny objects. <laughs> right? Now, don't expect Dr. Patel's speed here. Shot. Look at that. What a perfect little thing. Hmm? 
No, we're not going to do a roll call. We don't need to. This is right where his, his pain is. You can see from the X marks. Shot. Tell is far better than I am at this. Probably is what? Shot? Are you saying Patel's better than me? No, oh, maybe he's on a cruise. Probably. <laughs> he's going to laugh at my technique. All right, let's go with the lateral. You can close those if you want. Hmm. I don't think so. I mean, but he is a big guy. Uh, I don't. I don't know. I would just hold pressure for a little longer. Maybe you're right. And just see what it looks like. You doing okay there, buddy? Okay. We're gonna need to. Um, Yeah, just be really careful with the arms. Just nice and slow. Where's the other needle? Huh? It's not the end of the world if I can't do a lateral. Okay, guys, it's not the end of the world. How's he doing? Okay. Um, so what are we doing with the arm boards? Do we have a solution or should we just go back to an AP? Let's close these up while we're waiting. Go ahead. Well, first, first open it. Open the, I don't know. Open uh, the Ayaban. You have a little pickup? I don't see one. What is it? Are we able to go lateral or not? Guys, we can put the armbar back on. So while we're while we're working on that, we're gonna just get these incisions closed. For those of you watching, you can actually see just how tiny they are. Seven millimeters each one. Not like the big ugly incision he had for the last surgery. Keep everything sterile, okay? Let's not get overly aggressive. I need a ray tech. Mm. Yeah, I would do just a little more pressure. And in the meantime, you have benzoin? All right. Are we able to do a lateral view? All right, not bad. Not bad at all. All right, back to an AP. The AP is going to be the more useful view anyway. Take your time. Are you hitting the arm board? If you are, you have to come towards me, get around the arm board, and then swing around. Yep. Nice and slow. Take your time. How's he doing? All right. So what we're doing here, we're closing the lumbar wounds, but we're also um, we're also uh, 
getting the uh, needles in position for the thoracic. Shot. 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 Let's go back to a lateral view. Hmm? How are you doing over there? You want to sit down? I don't know. I don't think so. Right? Yeah. It looks dry. And that needs to be bigger. That needs to be bigger. You need a little more room there. Yeah, that's fine. But that's, I want the Band-Aid one later. I need you to go higher with the fluoro and shot. Okay. Not bad. The other guy can go in a little further. Shot. Uh -huh. AP. Get that centered. Let it dry up. Now you have the injection. Yes. For the, yeah. Is that it? Yes, sir. No, but that's not even right. Come on. Jordan, you should be able to figure that out by now. I shouldn't have to tell you. Center it up. That's not too bad, but try to get it uh, a little bit more. That's good. That's good. Shot. 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 Right. Two more. All right. This will be hard with the hardware. I need five more minutes, shot.
Shot. Shot. Shot. Next one. Shot. 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 Okay, we're good. Half a mil at each. Uh, that's an awful lot there. Huh? That's fine. Let me. Watch these. Done. Thank you, everybody. Great work. All right. Well, let's see if that helps us paint up higher. Okay, we're done with the uh, laser surgery and the thoracic MBB. I'm going to call the EBL one mil bilateral DLDR L45 and bilateral MBB. That was one of the things I noticed right away eight, was that like, I nine, had some control again, which was kind of cool, you know. You all right, if you have any questions, sort of folks watching, just go ahead and type them up, and I'll come are. answer them for so you. Great job, everyone, today. You Thank you so much for your patience. Back. You're to feel like you're, you're able to play. Let's but, work uh, on turnover times, okay? So Trying to see what we can do to shorten them. This song is called Oscar de Grouch Goes to the Meat. So yeah, we're a pretty musical family here. We do a, play a lot of shows. We're in a band called Positive Chaos, and uh, this is my bass. Picked it up a little while ago. Um, we use it for acoustic shows. This is actually our guitarist's acoustic guitar. Um, he actually just moved down here from Connecticut, so it's kind of cool having him down. This is our violinist and my fiance's violin, who uh, has been in the band with us for a bunch of years now, and she's having some fun with that. This here's my acoustic guitar, um, which will be hanging out with later. And then this is our drummer's bassist of all things. So uh, yeah, that's, that's that guy. And uh, a couple months ago, it'd be pretty much impossible to pick this guy up off the wall without some pain. So it's kind of cool that I'm able to start doing that again um, from here. And I waited for you. So that was cool. Like uh, at this point, I wouldn't have been able to do this 
I don't know, a month ago? And now I'm able to play guitar again. So it's kind of nice getting back. And uh, getting the band Positive Chaos back together is going to be pretty fun, and we're really looking forward to it. Thanks, Dr. Duke. And we know this is the way to live. And you keep on calling my um, Yeah, so my name is Dave. Um, last year I was in a auto accident. It was August. Um, T-bone accident in the area. Um, suffered some neck injuries. Basically kind of uh, spent some months just kind of dealing with it. Then decided to uh, talk to a chiropractor. Started looking at it. Uh, from there, we I did the epidural injections. And those were uh, pretty successful. I was feeling a little better. And then uh, woke up one day early, I think it was March, and I was agony. Like, I couldn't move, couldn't lift my arm, aggravating the bottoms of my fingers. Like everything, everything hurt from the base of my skull down to all the way into the, the very base of my pinky. So it was, it was kind of tough. Like, you know, everything that you did is now different. Like you're, everything hurts and it, you know, makes you irritable. It's, it's, it's like this like burning, stinging pain. So you, you kind of spend a lot of time like, going around things. Spent a lot of time like tiptoeing through what you can and can't do. And so I decided it was time to time to see somebody about it. So I went and found Dr. Duke Majin. You know, you spend a lot of time going to different doctors' offices for something like this because you don't really know. You're, you're you're looking for you're looking for something to fix you. So I, I actually found Dr. Duke Majin online. Like it wasn't it wasn't like a referral sort of deal. So I go into the office and it's it's bright, which is different. A lot of doctor's offices are dark and they're kind of scary. So you go in and everybody's pretty happy. You're like, okay, this is a change. And uh, you know, you talk to the staff there and they're, they're excited to see you. Not only that, but they booked me the day after. Like I called them and they, were, they had a spot for me the day, the next day. That was huge. So uh, you know, you go in there and you're talking to them and they're, they're you know, they're, they're exuding this like sort of air that things are going to be okay. And uh, they send you in, and I, I met with uh, Dr. Duke Majin's assistant, Luis, who's a great guy. Um, he started setting me up, and he's going through the x-rays and kind of saying, like, hey, listen, this is what you got going on. Dr. Duke Majin's going to come in and explain it further to you. So Dr. Duke Majin comes in, and uh, he's, he's got an air confidence about him. You, you feel better when he's talked to this guy. And he's, I remember him saying, like, you know, you're, you're in trouble. You're, you have some issues here. But as he left, he was like, but we're going to patch you up. And that was the first time that I didn't feel fear in like three months. It was the first time that you felt good. You felt like, we're gonna be okay. We're getting back to being okay. And that was a huge thing. Like this confidence that he had, this swagger that he had that he came in and he was like, we're gonna patch you up. And that was it. And it was like, all right, that's, that's huge. Like that was a huge feeling. Yeah, when I woke up in surgery, I, I noticed that I was, I could, it felt like a garden hose had unraveled in my arm. I could feel things again, like it wasn't this like wrapped up tight pain. Like yeah, there's there's obviously surgical pain involved there, but it's you know you feel instantly better than you were, and it's it's kind of this. It's no longer like shooting down into your arms. It just feels like things are starting to heal. Like things are back in the order that they should be. They're back kind of feeling the way that they should. So uh, it, and that was something I noticed that day. Like, you know, you're a little groggy from the medicine and all that stuff, but at the same time, you feel better, like, instantly. If you have neck pain, like, or back pain, any, anything spinal, like, these are the guys to talk to. These are the best in the business. Like, this is, this is what they do. And, uh, yeah, I'd highly recommend them. I would recommend them friends, family, strangers, absolutely. Like, they're, yeah, I would highly recommend them right there. Since the surgery, I, with uh, Dr. Duke, I'm able to get back to what I love to do. And that's the best part of it. Like, Dr. Duke set me on the path to getting back to doing what I love. So that's huge. And that's, yeah, I mean, that's, that's awesome. Thanks, Dr. Duke. Wow. Cool. That sounds amazing. Thanks. That was probably one of the things I noticed right away was that like I had some control again, which was kind of cool, you know? You still have that sort of, your brain's relearning where things are again. So now that you're, you're back to getting healthy, it's, it's starting to come back. You're starting to feel like you're, you're able to play. But, uh, but uh, yeah, I'll play, this song is called Oscar de Grouch Goes to the Movies.
So yeah, we're a pretty musical family here. We do a, play a lot of shows. We're in a band called Positive Chaos, and uh, this is my bass. Picked it up a little while ago. Um, we use it for acoustic shows. This is actually our guitarist's acoustic guitar. Um, he actually just moved down here from Connecticut, so it's kind of cool having him down. This is our violinist and my fiance's violin, who uh, has been in the band with us for a bunch of years now, and she's having some fun with that. This here's my acoustic guitar, um, which we'll be hanging out with later. And then this is our drummer's bassist of all things. So uh, yeah, that's, that's that guy. And uh, a couple months ago, it'd be pretty much impossible to pick this guy up off the wall without some pain. So it's kind of cool that I'm able to start doing that again. Okay, hey, Dr. Dig Majum here, and we are just wrapping up surgery on a patient who came from out of state, from Louisiana, and he had a herniated disc at L4-5. So the back of his disc at L4-5, the L4 and the L5 bone, the back of the disc was blown out on both sides, and the nerves coming out of the holes here, called the neuroforamen, they were actually getting pinched and irritated right there on both sides. So I came in kind of at, a, at an angle from the back like this. And I went just underneath the nerve root right there and got into the disc. And I used the laser to repair the back of that 045 disc on both sides. Now, he was also complaining about pain further up um, his spine. So he has a fusion there. I think his pain's coming from the joint right above, that facet joint. So I went in and I numbed up that facet joint with Novocaine on both sides. We're going to see whether or not it helps them. We did what's called an MBB, medial branch block. And a medial branch is the little nerve that comes out of that foramen that comes and wraps around and goes to the facet joint. It's called the uh, medial branch or the dorsal ramus. That's the technical long term. First and last name for the nerve. Medial branch of the dorsal ramus. So I went in and numbed it up uh, um, at two levels there in order to see if it's going to give him relief at those facet joints. If it gives him relief, then he needs a rhizotomy done, which is an easy thing to do. Dr. Patel does that procedure. All right, we have a question. We just answered it. Any other questions? That's it. That's it. Thanks for joining us. I hope you enjoyed the surgery live stream. Remember to check us out on Facebook and Spine Surgery Support Group, as well as download our free app, and you could use it to learn a lot more about spine issues. Nice uh, being with you today, and I hope you all learned a lot.